been uh, been said that you're from a church of Satan. I think that's that's disrespectful. I've got tough skin. What? Likewise, you know, we all get criticised sometimes. But you're right. We have to have tough skin, bro. But let me let me say this to you, right? But I mean, I, I don't mind. I don't know if you might have been recorded. That's okay. Okay. Basically, as Muslims, we believe in one God. We believe in one God. And I, as a Christian, I, I take it that you also believe in one God. Am I right in saying that? Yes. Okay. And in the Quran, I'm going to give you the Islamic verses. And I want you to sort of like digest the verse and understand the meaning behind the verse. Allah says in the Quran, He says, Kul huwallahu ahad. Say Allah is one. So we believe that Allah is unique. We believe that Allah has no partners. He has no associates. Allah has no board of trustees. We believe that God is ultimately one. And there is nothing like comparable to God. Allah has samad. God the everlasting. We believe that God does not have any counterpart beside him. So in other words, there's no one that's equal to God. God has no comparisons and God has no board of trustees. There's no one that's comparable unto the Creator. Also Allah says, Lam yalid wa lam yulad. I beget not, neither was I begotten. So we believe that the Creator, I'm, I feel so far you may agree with me. You believe, do, do you agree that God has no children? Or, or, or am, I, am I incorrect in saying, do you believe that God has children? When we say Father, Son, that's an analogy. Okay. Do you, I listen to what you say. My friend texted me. Do you mind if I just check the message? Go ahead. I'll just, sure, sure, no yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I'll, I can keep. Uh, I'll just listen. Okay. No, no, because I don't want to. You, you, you check your message. And we'll come back to this. Uh, okay. Sorry. No, no, it's okay. So, in the Quran, Allah says, "Lam yalid wa lam yulad." I beget not, neither was I begotten. Wa lam yakun lahu kufran ahad. And equal to me is nobody. So God has no equals. Now, I understand that you believe in the concept of the Trinity, that the Father is, and if I'm wrong, correct me, okay? Do you believe that God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are all, they, they, you don't believe that they are separate gods, you believe that they are one God, is that correct? Yeah. I don't want to define your belief, I want you to tell me what you believe. Orthodox Trinitarianism is different to Protestantism and Catholicism. Fundamentally, we believe in the monarchy of the Father. So the Father has no cause, the Son and the Holy Spirit have a cause. So mm. when we say they're different, we don't mean to say they're separate. But when we say separate, we say that they're different in origin. The Son is different to the Father in origin. It's the same as the Holy Spirit, that's what we mean by different. But they're the same in essence, they're different in origin to the Father. Okay. So when Jesus was worshipping, because yeah. in, remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was worshipping his God and he was asking God to help him. Do you believe that God was praying to another God? Because if you believe that Jesus is God, do you believe that Jesus was God on earth? Absolutely. Okay. Do you mean when you pass this cup or like my God, why have you forsaken me? Is that what you're trying to like elucidate? No, because there's, there's two, sorry, sorry. There, no, no, sorry. There's two ways you can look at this. When Jesus was on the cross, right? He said, Eli, Eli, Lemada Sabachthani, why have you forsaken me? Yeah, so the so, Orthodox tradition is that Christ is directly quoting David. He's not saying, so in, in Protestantism, there's an idea that the Father is eternally damning the Son. Right, we don't subscribe to that. We say that Christ is quoting David. So Christ appropriated what David said. Everything Christ did on earth, he appropriated for us. Sorry, my phone's ringing. I'll listen to what you say, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, the guy who invited me is calling me. Okay, go, go for it, go for it. I'm sorry, he, he's Muslim and he wanted me to come here and like, I'm just... No, 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 no. I don't want to be rude anymore. No, 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 no. Take the call. Take it. Is he, is, he, is, he, is, he, is he coming? <laughs> is he coming? Hey, see, I don't know where he is. Oh, tell me. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, he can Stick your hand out. Yeah. <laughs> Hello? He knows you're here, yeah? yeah. Uh, oh, okay, you're there. Are you on the way? <laughs> yes. Oh, sorry, because I'm in the middle of a video off, and I didn't want to be rude by like answering your call. 
<laughs> okay, so like, just just copy and like tag in, and, and we'll speak from there. Sorry about that. No, 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 Oh, it's, it's just a... Something like that. Carry on, carry on. Yeah. One more thing. Yeah, so... Yeah. As Muslims, we believe that Jesus is a prophet of God, right? We do, not, we do not say that Jesus is God, or we don't say that Jesus is part of the, the, the unity or the triune nature of God. Because there are verses in the Bible that clearly... We need to ask ourselves, what did the disciples... What was their conception of Jesus? Did the disciples conceive Jesus to be God? Now I understand they believe Jesus is God and he's part of the triune nature of God. But the question is, what did the disciples, the ones that ate with him, the ones that breathed beside him, the one it's like it's like the companions of the Messenger of Allah. How did the, the companions of the Prophet of God consider Prophet Muhammad? And the same question we can now reroute back to Jesus. How did the the disciples of Jesus who loved him, who sat next to him, they, they, they ate next to him and they, they learned from him. How did they perceive Jesus? Can I just and, okay. Sorry, just one more thing. There's a verse in John chapter 9 verse 9, you know the blind man? Yeah. Right, the blind man when he was cured by Jesus and when he was questioned as to who Jesus' identity was, Jesus, the, the man responded, he said that this is a prophet of God. This is a prophet of God and these are the people that ate, they took from him, they took knowledge from Jesus and these are the people that were close to Jesus and they loved Jesus. They probably loved Jesus more than me and you put together but they never... Yeah, so you use the word clear, can I just like hop and zone into that word? Yeah, of course. In a relative sense, one verse can be clearer than the other, one verse can be more vague. I'm not denying that. Relatively speaking, I can open Matthew more and say this, this verse is very ambiguous, right? But what's your litmus test for saying this is clear? Because for me, the Orthodox Church or the exegesis of the Old Testament is not Catholicism, it's not Islam, it's not Judaism, it's the Orthodox Church. They are my exegetes and I believe in the tradition of the Church. So, how can you like prove to me? What, what is the litmus test for a clear and vague text? Okay. Are you following are you following the words of Jesus or are you following the, 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 the teachings of the church? That's what I want to establish. We believe that uh, the church contains the entire apostolic deposit. So when Christ roamed the earth, of course he said things that weren't reported. So the church, we kept those things and we kept them sacred and we, we uh, protected them. I understand that there are verses that are ambiguous. Ambiguous verses by definition means that it's open up to various interpretations. That's the reason why I quoted that particular verse where when the blind man was cured, he said to, he said, when he was questioned as to who cured you, the man responded, it was the prophet of God. That, that's a clear verse. It's not ambiguous because when you talk about verses that are ambiguous, you can open up an ambiguous verse to various interpretations. That's why I don't tend to use verses that are ambiguous. I try to use verses that have clear crystal meaning. I'll give you an example. In John 17 verse 3, I'm not sure how familiar with John 17 verse 3. Jesus said, and this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Jesus identifies the Father as the only true yeah, God. Yeah. Do you accept that? Of course. So what I would just say is that the word God in the New Testament has multiple reference. So it can pick out the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And as if you look in the how, how it's used in the Greek, right? It has multiple reference. So when Christ said that there is a true God, that there is a one God, I have no problem accepting that because it has multiple reference. What do you mean multiple reference? Okay, so in the Old Testament, if we start from the Septuagint, I, I don't know how it works in the Hebrew, but if you look at how it, uh, God is used, God can refer to, I'm not saying that angels and demons are gods or people are God, but the way God is used, 
it can pick out other things like angels and demons. The Bible isn't admitting to them being actual gods, but I'm just saying that the word God, this is the word consophallacy, it's got multiple reference. So can God be used to refer to the Father as the true God? Sure, I have no problem saying that, I happily admit that. But if you look at how, I don't have the Greek lexicon or the, I don't have verses with that, sorry, I can't That's understand fine. it. But if you look at how it's used in the Greek manuscripts, the Greek text, the word God has multiple reference. That's what I, I say to that. I have no problem saying the Father is the true God. Okay, so if you accept that, that, that the Father is the only true God, right? I understand that there are in the Bible, there are, you can, there are terminology. Like, I'll give you an example. In Exodus chapter 7, verse 1, Moses is called Elohim. Are you aware of this? I've heard that. I don't know the verse. I've heard this. Said. Right. It says that I shall send thy brother as Elohim unto Pharaoh, right? Now, Elohim in Hebrew is used for the father in genesis chapter 1 verse 1 in hebrew it says barashit bara elohim shamayim in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth so the word elohim is used for the father and it's also used for it's used for um for moses okay. but we're not going to obviously i'm not going to extend i'm not going to say well Moses is the father. Right. So I understand, so I'm just picking up on the point you put. I understand that um, so when you use the term God, it can be used for like demigods, but when it comes to the father alone, right? It is very unique because in John 17 verse three, it says, you are the only true Theos. You're the only true God. Yeah, okay. And Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Because he, he used the gospel of St. John as an example. You know, in John chapter 1 verse 1 where it says, And not he no logos, ke logos, and postum feon, ke theos no logos. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. I know that you can say, oh, hang on, this verse in John is more clear. But don't you see from the get-go, uh, the beloved evangelist St. John is saying that the literal speech of the Father is the, the same as an essence. You don't see that? Sorry? Do you not see the... the St. John the beloved evangelist, you don't see what he's trying to say from the beginning from John 1 verse 1, what he's trying to explain what the Logos is Okay, the Logos, right? Ke Logos en proston theon, right? At the end of that verse in John 1 1, it carries a definite article Are you, are you, are you... I, I mean, yeah, I, I've already to... said my Muslim apologies, but I just want to say that this like the definite article, the actual like Greek Testament scholars, they've spoken, they've refuted this to death like this, this objection about even Jehovah's Witnesses, the Neo Aryans, they say that the Greek actually means this, but our actual scholars refuted this. Right. Now, you know, well, well, well let's, let's discuss it, right? Right, it says, in the beginning was the word. Yes. Right? En prostontheon, right? And the word was with God, and the word was God. Yes. Right? So there's multiple ways. You know the end verse where it says, and the word was God? What's the, what's, what's the Greek word used here in the last portion of that sentence? It fails in the logos. Right. Now, according to Christian scholars like C.K. Barrett, are you... Is he are you f Sorry? Is he Orthodox Christian? If he's not Orthodox Christian, I don't, I, don't mean, I don't mean to be mean. If he's not Orthodox, if he's Protestant Catholic, I don't care what to say. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm quoting you Orthodox Christians here. Is he Orthodox Christian? Yes. What's his name? C.K. Barrett. Okay, I'll ask him. Research him, research the name, right? According to C.K. Barrett, it says that when the last portion of the verse in John 1 1 carries the definite article, it does not necessitate, right, that it's specifically pointing towards the deity of, of Christ. Because we know that there are other people in the New Testament, in the, in the, in the, in the Old Testament, that also are called prostontheon, like Moses, for example. Moses called a God. So, for example, it says in John, uh, Exodus 7 verse 1, it says, Do you not see that I shall send Moses as a God to Pharaoh? The same word is used here in Greek. If you go to the Greek lexical, uh, I'll take the Septuagint. The, right. If you take the Septuagint, the same word is used here, right? But no one's going to say, oh, Moses is... speaks into space and time and that uh, his word has started from this point. We say that when we say begotten as an analogy, we say Christ is eternally sprung forth. Now, some apologists in the past talk about the sun, photons, I don't know, the rays of the sun. Analogies aren't perfect. So you said the Father, so the Son eternally came? It's eternally coming, it's an eternal springing forth of the, uh, from the Father. 
Okay. So do you believe that Jesus is eternal? Yes. Because he's, he eternally sprung from the Father? Yes. Okay, my question is this as follows. If you have two eternal beings, right? Explain to me, if you've got two eternal beings, how can they be father and son? Because in order to have a son, by necessity, you must have a beginning. By necessity. If you're saying that the, that the son emanated yes, sure, sure. eternally from him, then how can that be a... That's like... That's, they're like brothers. You know, two eternal brothers, I can understand if you said that. But if you're saying a father and a son, by default and by definition, you have to have a beginning. Yes, sure. okay. so, so how do you understand? How do you... How do you call, I, I can't paraphrase everything St. Basil says, but St. Basil the Great in the Hexameron, at length, he tackles this concept of beginning. So when the heretics went to St. Basil and said, hang on, Christ has a beginning, St. Basil... St. Basil talks about how your intellect, your rational mind, because people believe in natural theology, we naturally inquire, how can there be two eternal beings? He talks, he uses analogies of things like the beginning of a road, the beginning of a house. Now, I don't want to speak about knowledge because I have read these patristic authors. Well, I just, I just want to say, I'll listen to you, but St. Basil the Great in his hexameron, he refused this argument. I'll, I'll listen to what you say. No, but I, I, I like to... Can I, can I just quickly, yeah. what evidence did St. Basil the Great use? It's apostolic... Because that would be interesting, yeah. yeah. So what, what evidences did he use to prove the Holy Spirit is divine? You know which verse? Because I've got the book by James D. Kelly, Early Christian Doctrines. I haven't memorized it. Okay, so Basil the Great, first of all, it's very important. Why does the church uh, need the Old Testament, right? And the New Testament. So number one, they consider the Old Testament to be sacrilegious because for two reasons. Number one, because it foreshadows the coming of Jesus. Yep. And number two, it, um, it confirms the word and the works of Jesus Christ. Yeah, so that's, that's, these are the two reasons why you consider Old Testament to be as sacred as the New Testament. And in fact, even Justin Martyr says that. Saint Justin Martyr, yeah, the yeah, Theophanies. The Justin I, I Martyr, just yeah. say, in terms of which text is more sacred, there is a, for us in liturgy, the Gospels and Old Testament, they're mainly for liturgy. So it, I agree. So we I say agree. that there's a premacy, for example, in Orthodox service, we have a reading from St. Paul's epistles and the Gospels. I agree. We, we, we're not you know, saying that they're like this. We have premacy in the fact that it's a liturgical document. I agree. for worship. 100%. I agree with you. And that's why Eusebius, when he, when he submitted the, the creed at the Council of Nicaea, uh, to fought over Arian, he claims that Arian, well, yeah. I have the I have the liturgical tradition that goes back to the fathers, right? So in re in reality, um, the the concept of like a trinity is actually a liturgical tradition. So when you say Saint Basil the Great, he used the evidence for the Holy Spirit from the Great Commission from Matthew chapter twenty eight verse nineteen. Okay, sure. Yeah, but there's no explicit statement where it depicts that the Holy Spirit is fully divine, and that's the reason why you will find that Saint Basil the Great was the first. Um, was the first bishop of Alexandria that proposed that the Holy Spirit is fully divine. So he's using the, the he's using a baptismal formula to substantiate the deity of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. But before that, no church father ever viewed it. Believe me, I don't want to yeah. speak from. That's fine. That's fine. I've heard in the Orthodox apologetics that there are other patristic fathers who use Old Testament to reference the Holy Spirit's divinity. That's fine. I've got no problem with that. But. Even if even your apostolic fathers, uh, do you know Barnabas? Yes. Yeah. So when you when the, um, when they uh, sorry they sorry for Barnabas. No, no, the uh, the apostolic father. Okay, okay. Yeah. The Barnabas uh, basically states that the the study or or the nature of Christology um, confirms in the Old Testament is not based it is not based on um, clear cut. Neither it's even ambiguous. He said the word gnosis. Which is okay. mystical, yeah, 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 meaning mystical. that it's beyond the warranted fact. So, you, so what, what I say, if you appeal to the tradition with the view that there is no clear cut verses of the Trinity in, in the New Testament or the deity of Christ, right? I've got no problem of you accepting that. But what I don't accept is when you say, well, there are clear cut statements where Jesus claimed to be God in the Bible. Because even your own like apostolic fathers ha have to say that. Our exegetical principle using the Old Testament to prove the divinity of Christ is based on Gnosis, it's mystical. It's a mystical interpretation. We say ultimately it yeah. is mystical. But we can't, like I said before, yeah. no analogy is perfect. So when a, a Christian a missionary talk about the Son, the Son representing the Trinity, right. we say that's not perfect. So ultimately, the Holy Trinity is a holy mystery. Right, I see. But, uh, but here's the difference. There's a difference between ambiguity and mystical. 
Mm. Do you see the, disting the distinguishment? That? So ambiguous meaning it's plausible, it may be possible that it could refer to the divinity of Christ or the Trinity. But mystical is beyond that. It, it's, not even, it's not even ambiguous. Like for example, if you read the, the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 28 verse, verse 19, 19 uh, Jesus says, Go and baptize to all nations in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, St. Basil the Great used this as a proof that, okay, uh, the Holy Spirit may be divine because it, it's because you have to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So therefore, it shows the, the, the deity of the Holy Spirit. But that's not based on even ambiguity. This is like, it's, it's mysterious. It's not even clear cut. It's not even ambiguous. It's like, for example, like, it's like trying to fit your belief and you're trying to find any proof. So do you agree with us that your belief should be based upon proof? So we don't, we don't establish... Rather than it being mystical, yeah. should it be based on should some type of evidence? Some type of evidence. That yeah. you can literally like refer to yeah. and you... Because when you have a belief that has no evidence, yeah. if not evidence-based, your foundation is, it can be shaky. Yeah, it's like yeah. building a house yeah, yeah. With, yeah. with very, very structural, yeah. less structural integrity. Yeah. But if you have a faith that's built on some type of evidence, then your faith and your belief could be stronger. So, so, yeah, the world says orthodoxy is grounded on revelation and logic. When we say revelation, we, just, we don't mean just Bible, we mean the entire apostolic deposit. Now, in I terms agree, of logic, I agree. I agree. I'm not a resident philosopher, speaker, scorner. If I, can, can I give a plug to a YouTuber, if you don't mind? Do you know who Chef Asra Rashid is? Yeah, yeah. I've heard of you. Yeah. It, it's Paul Williams, like, liked it. Is he like a blog in theology? Yeah, like, I know. I've I'm heard some people say he's a heretic. Like, can I name yeah. Paul Williams? No, I'm, I'm not here. Yeah. I'm okay, not so here to represent them. Jay yeah, Dyer, yeah. He, de he debated Chef Asra Rashid yeah. in regards to the Holy Spirit. He debated Paul Williams in, refer in reference to his uh, John passages. Right. He debated Shabir Ali. So, but I can never be a. Pro I'm not educated enough to help you, but I'll step up to the challenge and speak to you. I just want to say, if you're interested in it, watch Jay Dyer's debate with Asra Rashid. No problem. I'll, I'll watch yeah. it. I'll watch it. Like, those, you know, every second of those debates is packed with authors of politics. It's not Protestant, it's not Catholic, it's not freestyling Christianity like the people here, but actual revelation and metaphysical logic. Okay, no problem. Yeah. But what I would say to you, you would have to submit that your that the church tradition that you that you subscribe to have to make the admission that there are no clear verses of the divinity of Christ. There's no clear cut verses of the Trinity. They all they all admitted that their Jewish exegetical principles established to prove that uh, to um, to establish Christology is not based upon uh, clear-cut verses, based upon gnosis. It's a mystical interpretation. Like if I was to read in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, go and baptize to all nations in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That doesn't allude to me Trinity. It doesn't allude to me the deity of the Holy Spirit. Do you understand? So it's very interesting that St. Basil the Great was the first so bishop in to his hexameron, In St. Basil the Great's hexameron, he says that the rational intellect, your rational mind, will naturally inquire what is the beginning, what comes before the beginning. But St. Basil, he rebuts his saying that okay. the answer always outstrips your imagination. So, for example, uh, uh, maybe it's, is it Quran Hadith, as it says, the disbelievers will say, who created Allah and it's with shaitan, something like that. Is, is that There's a hadith, yeah, okay, that hadith. people would say, it come to a point where there's a who created Allah, and yeah. then the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, we should seek refuge in Allah, we say, I will Okay, Allah. so yeah, yeah it's we a say that as humans, we possess the rational organ, we want to know why, mm. how this happened. But we say that if you keep asking, what came before God, right? It outstrips your imagination. That's why we say Holy Trinity is a mystery. I see, so you're saying that the intellect confirms the revelation, or, the re or is it the other way around? The revelation confirms that your intellect. That's we what have you're revelation and logic to prove the Trinity, right? Okay. So, for example, when, whenever someone uses the analogy of a sun, we admit it's not a perfect analogy. It's like photons, I don't know physics. The analogy is not supposed to be perfect uh, exactly. anyway. I understand. Yeah, that. I understand. We say that yeah, yeah. If you, if we explain the Trinity to you, and then you keep asking us, like, okay, I can't brain your question, but it will it outstrip your imagination. But if you want to ask me a question like, uh, how can Jesus be 100% God and 100% man? There are actually authors apologetics to those questions. If you answer like, how can Christ die on the cross? How can God die? We have. Church fathers. By the way, do you death. believe that that Jesus is 100% both man and God at the same time? Yeah, I, I believe the Coptic. Or I don't. Want to, I'm not Coptic Orthodox, but I believe the Coptic Orthodox Egyptian Assy Assyrians. They say that Christ had only had one nature. The Eastern Orthodox. Do you believe they has two natures? Yes, of course. So he's both divine and fully human. Um, fully so human. can I just say one thing? So you mentioned about um, the importance of you know uh, intellect. You know, it, it confirms with the revelation. Okay, uh, I don't believe in natural theology. I, I understand that. I understand that. But you, you do. But are you? 
do you acknowledge the struggle between the church tradition and the scripture? No. So I, I think it's harmonious. So do you know that Tertullian and he's not a yeah. church father for us. He's a heretic for us. Tertullian. Tertullian is a heretic for Tertullian you. Tertullian origin. We're not. We're not saints okay. to us. That's not the point. The point is, if you're saying that, um, if you're saying that, uh, that our intellect can uh, does give us, you know, proof of revelation, then any sect, like Gnostic sects, for example, would use exactly the same. Like, for example. Um, if you have like the Basilians, for example, or if you have any other Gnostic sect, they will say exactly the same too. They would also consider to be heresy, and they use the same documents. They they will use the same document, the same proof. Like this this verse is actually confirming our belief, and then you would come along and say, no, this verse doesn't appeal to your belief. It's actually supporting our belief. So where is the objectivity? That's my question to you, because the Gnostics would would oh, also yeah. view you as heresy, and you would view them as a heresy. Sure. So where would you come a common I'll ground? Uh... I, I read a bit about Gnostics in the past. Are, yeah. they, are there neo Gnostics today? Like, are there a few stragglers of this heresy? Okay. Are, I'm asking, are there? Sorry? Are there still like. Gnostic yeah, yeah, there are, there are. Yeah, 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 yeah. There are, there are, but it's very minute. Yeah, so like, very for example, um, a teacher writes a math equation on a board. There are hundred students come in, they all have a post and answer. They say, Oh, you're Roman Catholic, you're Protestant, you're Gnostic, you're your area, you're No, I'm not, I'm not even okay. talking about Catholicism and Protestant. Oh, okay, that's okay. to do with the canon. So if that's we to do say with the canon. There's, there's heresies just... floating about. Yeah, yeah. The fact that there are heresies floating about doesn't mean that there is a clear victor, a clear. Ah, but what I'm saying is that the Gnostics are using exactly the same verses that you're using to substantiate your belief. So who is right and wrong? Because the Gnostics would view you as a heresy. Uh, like, for example, po Polycarp. Uh, Polycarp says that um, St. Paul's letters is the foundation of Christianity, it's the cornerstone, right? And then you have Justin Martyr says um, that the, the, the four Gospels are the memoirs of the Apostles, what correct? Work Justin Martyr? Justin Martyr, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I, what I'm reading is the early okay. Christian doctrines by Jane D. Kelly. Jane D. Kelly is um, one of the most famous uh, patristic scholar. Is she awful though? I don't mean to like yeah. attack her or be mean to her. Is she awful though? That's fine, but would you agree with me that um, you, what, I'm trying to, what I'm trying to say is that there's no objectivity. That's yeah, what I'm trying to say. I get your objection, but yeah. when people name drop scholars, yeah. right, just like throw the names out there, what I'll say is the Protestant scholars, the Catholic scholars, they're, they're accused of this, but they pick and choose what church fathers they want. For example, the Protestants, when they say to me, you're from the church of Satan, yeah. they'll say, oh, this church father condemns you, but no, this church father says another thing. So it's like these Protestants. But what scholars, you have to understand. Use my church What's your name? Sorry, I forgot, I forgot to ask you your name. You can call me Christ Chris Christos. Okay, Christos. Okay, right, hard. Nice to meet you, Christos. What I will say to you is this look. The, the Bible was not canonized see, until very late. There's no problem with that. Yeah, no, no, but that's not the issue. The, 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 look, for example, you have many of the Gospels. Yeah, I mean, we're still counting. There's 49 Gospels that has been uh, discovered, right? Like Pseudopagrapha, you mean? Pseudopagrapha, yeah. Okay. But however, however, it wasn't canonized. Sure. So it's a monolithic. Christianity at that point was a monolithic. It was a very loose religion. We, so wait, yeah. So what I'm saying is that when Ignatius and when Tertullian were refuting the Gnostics, it was not at the point when the Bible was canonized. So each Christian sect believed that this was their scripture. So what Justin Martyr and what Tertullian had to fought is with the Gnostics because at that time there was no agreement. Everyone believed that their scripture is right, everyone's scripture yeah, right. Sure. Until the year 350 or if I'm not mistaken, not 350, it was later on, that's when the 27 books were confirmed. Yeah. yeah. So if you look at the early history of the Catholic Church, okay. there was a struggle between church tradition and scripture. So church tradition teaches, so do you know who Apollos is in the Bible? Yes, Apollos. Okay, yeah. so when Apollos didn't know about the Holy Spirit, the church informed them. Do you know who the Mandanes are? Mandanes, yeah. Mandanes, okay. yeah. So yeah, they yeah. believe, John, yeah, John, John the Baptist. Baptist. Yeah. So we say that, yes, there were, I wouldn't say cults, there were like sects, uh, heresies floating about in the midst of everything, yeah. but it was a one Lord, one body, one faith. Yeah. It was the church's role, those man, early mundane, those early Gnostics, yeah, to teach them. And maybe, maybe you can say to me, okay, how do you know you're right, uh, your Apollos is right? We say it's apologetically, historically proven that orthodoxy can trace itself back to the apostles. They have apostolic succession. Now, okay, Arius had apostolic succession. Some of the um, Nestorius had apostolic Nestorius, succession. Yeah, okay, yeah. they came from the apostles. But yeah. that doesn't mean they're infallible because it's the entire patristic consensus. We don't rely on the. For example, if orthodoxy banked, relied on Tertullian origin, mm. when Tertullian origin were ousted, okay, or when some other guy was anathematized or excommunicated, yeah. we don't rely on one guy. Sometimes uh. heresies do pop up, Aryan heresy, you know, it's going. There's it's the heresy that pops up in Islam as well. Yeah, There's no yeah. problem with that. My point is that what is the principles that you're using? 
that's my point because the, the Gnostics are going to use exactly the same proofs that you're using so who is right and wrong so that's the reason why if you there's a struggle be, between the church tradition and scripture that's why you have something called the rule of faith right where do you get that rule of faith from how do you establish the principles laid out because we, we can we can refute the heresies in Islam because we have a methodology that we follow. We follow the Quran, we follow the, the Sunnah, the teachings of the Prophet, and the Salaf Salih, the righteous predecessors, the first three generations. Yeah, you don't have that methodology in place. That's my point. Like for example, Papias, you believe that Papias said uh, Matthew is Hebrew. Is that what you mean? Sorry. Are you getting on to? Oh, sorry, I didn't. No, no. What, I, what I'm saying is that what I'm saying is that the Gnostics are using exactly the same you know proofs as you the only difference is you're using a different exegetical principles that they're using so there's no objectivity the lost because at that time the scripture was not canonized everyone believed that their book was right yeah, yeah. so I, I understand your objection that's why there was a struggle I, I, I fully understand the objection if we extrapolate it to a wider sense every faith system disagrees Judaism rejects my exegetes of, of the, course so <laughs> I, I don't get what you fundamentally want to oh, say no. I, I get your objection but because your church, because your, because the church fathers mentioned that the Jewish exegetical principles that we adopt for Christology is not based on proof; it's based on mystical interpretation. When we say mystical and interpretation, at the ultimate, in, paradigm, in, ultimate yeah. paradigm level, it is mystical. But before we get to that paradigm, yeah. we can prove it with logic, revelation, apologetics. No, but, but if you but what's but, the principles that you laid out? Because it's it's what happened. It's called ECGesis. That's what I'm trying to say. Like ECGesis mean that. You've already formulated a belief, and now you're trying to search for proof that because, fits into it. Yeah, so within Judaism itself, in reference to the Trinity, sometimes people say it's laughable. How can you say the early Jews, what the Trinity was? We say that the early Israelites, yeah. they might not have a codified, coherent view. Good. But I'll, the I'll multiplicity, Very good. if you look at uh, I think Benjamin Somo, he talks about um, bodies in ancient Israel. Yes, he yes, talks yes. about how there's multiplicity in Judaism. Now, maybe you can find to uh, Rabbi Tovia Singer or a Rabbi, you yep. can get a Jew here yep. and yep. say, my ex users of the Bible, Old Testament, Tanakh Torah is invalid. But I'll say to the same Jew, yes, good, within yes. Judaism, within the Rambam, within their own rabbis, they debated Rambam, yeah, yeah, uh, Rambam, Maimonides, Maimonides, yeah, yeah, yeah. who the angel of the Lord is, who is this voice in the ex in the bush because on within judaism it wasn't clear cut I'll, I'll 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 respond to you it's a very good point that you made um very good point you see in in judaism they have their own tafsir yeah like they have their own exegetical principles yeah so you have something called the pishat in the midrash yeah, yeah. so the pishat is the obvious reading yeah the plain reading yeah. and the midrash is an allegorical yeah and in judaism the like orthodox jews they have no problem accepting the midrash interpretation allegorical but what they will never accept is if any if any belief goes against the radical oneness of God, it will not be yeah, accepted. That will be thrown out completely. That will be thrown out completely. So if you try to if you try to speak yeah. about a Trinity, yes. right? And if you were to, to say that yeah. Jews believe in a Trinity, yeah. this will go against their base fundamental beliefs. This, yeah. their, this is their core beliefs. This is their that core God beliefs. is one. Yeah. It's like it's, it's like with Muslims, we believe that Allah is one. There is no other. So if you, and I know it's what Christians do, I'm not saying you by the way, but what I'm saying what Christians do, they try to extract from the Old Testament verses that, I, again, ambiguous, yeah. to try to extract a trinity, a triune formula yeah. from the Old Testament to say, hey, this is evidence, like um, Genesis 126, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And they will say, oh, this is evidence that because God uses the word us, this refers to a triune God. But yeah. so so I think at best it's I wouldn't use that verse. But I, I, I know I know I know I know you wouldn't. But I know sorry. I know you wouldn't. I know I know you wouldn't. But I'm saying that there are Christians that will use those verses to interpret, give their own spin on on, on verses yeah. that even Jews don't even hold as a as a belief system, you know? So this is why this is why I always argue where is the direct evidence from Jesus' mouth? It's better to go with something clear-cut than ambiguous. And that's why I always argue, where's the clear-cut verse where Jesus says, I am God? What is the litmus test for clear-cut? Because for my, ex for my church, it's clear, but for you it's not clear. So what's the litmus test? Okay, I'll give you an example. You know, for example, where God, you know, oh, uh, the Father, for example, the Father says, the Father makes a declaration that He is God, right? right? He says, I am God, before me there is none, neither shall be after me. Um, there are verses in the Bible where Jesus says you should worship him and him only you shall serve. So Jesus actually refers worship to the Father alone when he will speak. I think it's in Matthew chapter 4 verse 7 where the devil tried to tempt Jesus and then Jesus says 
you should worship the Lord thy God and him only you shall serve him only you shall worship so that's quite clear that's quite clear where Jesus is referring to the Father as the only God, only true God so for me when I want something clear it has to be something similar to what the Father says so if you said that the, that the Son eternally emanates from the Father mm. that means by extension of that the Father, the, the Son should mimic the Father in, in, in terms of his words as well because if you're saying that Jesus is God that means Jesus should mimic God in the same it's way mode of being. It's, it's mode of being mode so when you, what do you mode mean? of being so de describe that do you what? subscribe to that view? Mode of being. Yeah, mo mo like modalism. Do you no, not modalism. Okay, modal being. I, I, okay. So when you say mode of being, explain yourself. Yeah, yeah. When God creates the world, world, God is in essence. God created the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The different modes of being. So you said God created the Father and Son. Well, when when Christians say God created the world, yeah. it was through the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Through the do you say through the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit? Is yes. that what you said? God created through the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. So when we say that, I'm trying we, to understand. Yeah, when, when we say we worship God, like um, how do I say this? We worship in spirit. We worship Christ, and we, we direct that worship to Father. I mean, I'm I'm not the best like resident expert on this. Like, no problem. No problem. I mean, no problem. Jay Dyer he explains this very coherently, very eloquently. Mode of being. In his in his debate with Daniel Pikachu in the Daniel Hikachu, yeah, I know. He explains what mode of being is to Daniel Hikachu in modern day debate, the channel. Okay. Okay, so um, I, I don't mean to derail, but when you say the clearness, for example, I know for you Muslims, the Old Testament isn't authoritative. We never say for you it's, uh, it's, it's holy, it's, it's gospel. I know it's not a gospel for you. But what will happen is, what we see is that when there's verses like the Yahweh, he, um, he, he empties his name into a novel. Or when we see um, Samson, Samson's parents worship the angel of the Lord and they ask what's, what's his name and the angel says why do you ask my name sin is wonderful now you can bring a Jew and maybe he's got his oral tradition but do you not see that even within Judaism Jews don't get out of this problem they can say uh, uh, Tawheed, oneness all they want right they can keep doing it but what we keep seeing is that this angel of the Lord this divine figure is worship now for example metaphysics okay this idea of the voice how for example, if within Judaism, this voice in the bush, right? But when we say the word descended, even Jews themselves had debates over what is actually meant. So it wasn't a clear cut from the get go. It's always been. And when you say clear, ambiguous, yes, in a relative sense, I can open Matthew and say, aha, this verse is so ambiguous. But where's your litmus test? Because, okay, you, I, I know you think that. But what's the litmus test for saying that to me? Okay, so do you believe that there is someone other than God that deserves to be worshipped? The Father. So, other than the Father, do you believe that there's someone else that deserves to be worshipped? Because I can point out in the in the Bible, right, that other people received worship, yeah, so and they didn't object to the worship. I have to go to the Greek. I, I, I thought it was Latvian or something like. There's a Greek word that denotes what type of worship it is. So. Proskuneo. Okay, oh, sorry. Okay. No, Proskuneo. Proskuneo, okay. yeah. So yeah. in Daniel chapter two, yeah. verse forty-six. Nebuchadnezzar yeah. fell upon his face yeah. and worshipped Daniel. Yeah, yeah. You don't have no problem with Is Daniel God? It's different. Why? Because that venerating someone. It's like, I don't know. I, I saw some Muslims, they kissed their sex hand. Is that true? Sorry? You saw Muslims, some Muslims like, kiss the Imam's hand. That's just a sign yeah, of respect. That's, yeah, that's, 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 that's not so worship. So when you say someone bowed down, we don't mean that that's like idolatry. Because idolatry is mainly the heart. That means to show respect to someone. For example, the Ark of the Covenant, when the Israelites I, know, I think you missed it. his point. But does that show the divinity? Not that figure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. What exactly. Have to That's do the point. Is, I would have to get a Greek lexicon and look at how the word worship is used because in orthodoxy we accept this veneration of the prophets. We accept people bowing down to we don't say that they're God. We never say that. Okay, so why do you not accept that if you believe that, that the prophets receive veneration yes. and you agree that that veneration is not worship? It's not worship, never right. Right. Then why not so, so then apply why to you Jesus? Not accept, thank you. Why do you not extend that veneration the same because Jesus was worshipped? But Daniel was worshipped as well. Exactly. So then how do you reconcile to the difference between Jesus receiving worship? Because some Christians will argue, well, Jesus didn't, Jesus didn't, um, he didn't reject. He didn't say, hey, what, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. I'm not God. So Christians say, well, he didn't object to the worship. But then Daniel didn't object to the worship either. So we can either argue these two points. We can either say that Daniel is God to be consistent, right? 
And then you can say, well, Jesus is God because he received worship and he didn't object. But now the veneration that you, we both agreed that veneration was given to the prophet. Mm. We have to say that the veneration that Jesus received was also out of respect. Would you agree? Exactly, yeah. I'm, I'm asking your opinion. There were people who didn't understand his divinity, like some pastor boys who gave him that type of respect, yes. So, are you saying that some people didn't understand that Jesus was divine? Is that what you're saying? Oh no, that's in John's Gospel as well. But why would God? Yeah, yeah. Why would God? If God is the Most High, why would there why would there be people that? Yeah, just ignore that. <laughs> if you're saying to me that there are some people that didn't know Jesus was God, that means Jesus' divinity was never clear in the first place. Yeah. See, I give you an example. See, like the Father. The Father made it crystal clear from the very get-go that He is God. There was no ambiguity as to who the Father is. Everybody acknowledged, the Jews acknowledged that the Father is God. He, he never made, he never kept quiet and then revealed it at a later point. He made it very clear from the very beginning of time. Barashid bara Elohim In Hebrew, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So He's very clear as to who He is. But why is it, my brother, that Jesus is unclear as to who he is. Why do people have to guess? But why do people have to do guesswork? Oh, is he God? Is he not God? We're not sure. Why was he not clear as to who he is? Objection. Why didn't Christ from day one declare that he is God? Department? Sorry? Are you objecting to, in the sense that you want to know why when Christ roamed the earth, he didn't say to everyone, I'm God, worship me. Is that what you're saying? No, but why would he keep that secret though? That's my question. Why would he hide that information? If that's something integral, if you're saying that he, Jesus emanates from the Father, mm -hmm. that's something integral to his being. So he should make that very known. Like, hey, I'm God. I, I, you know, I'm walking, I'm walking in Jerusalem and, I'm, and here I am. Why would, why, did, why was that declaration not made? His mission was to die on the cross. And what would have happened is, I don't have the exact verse, but the verse that say that if they knew who Christ was, they would have forced him to be king. They would have forced him to defeat the Romans. So Christ's mission wasn't to start ruling the earth. I, the I, I think there's a problem with that, because if you read in John's Gospel, which um, the, 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 the Christian scholars have said, um, stated that you're the highest Christian find in John's Gospel. Um, they say that Jesus comes comes across as the esoteric figure. Oh, so, scholar, sorry, because if it's a Protestant scholar, oh, this is like consensus. Or, or, or like if you if you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, it, it's, it sounds very Jewish. But then when you look at John's Gospel, it, it, it sounds a lot oh, of Greek, I mean, Greek. Okay, this consensus is yeah. it heterodox, non-orthodox? No, that's 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 not the point. Well, because, that's, yeah. Even if it's a consensus, it doesn't matter if it's one hundred scholars saying sorry? this. What? Yeah. He needs to answer your question. Why is it that it was not Why do I care what they say? Even if you take away from the scholarship. I'm going to get back to it. Because that's the question you asked. And he didn't respond. And he has a response. And I will read it. Because Matthew, Mark and Luke, it comes across the Jewishness of Jesus. I'm going to get back to it. But then if you look at the John's Gospel, and there was no response. So, for example, if you read in Mark chapter 12, verse 29, yeah? One of the teachers of the law asked him, Good master, what okay. is the, the most important commandment? And Jesus said, Hear, o Israel, uh, the Lord that God, the Lord is one. So he's confirmed Moses. Now, if you look at John's Gospel, uh, the way how Jesus comes across is very, very ambiguous. And even the disciples said, You're not even speaking plainly. Up until when you read the 17th chapter, that's when, like the end of 16th chapter, that's when Jesus says, Now I will speak plainly to you, right? And that's the reason why, take away from the scholarship. You read John's Gospel independently, you would even find that Jesus' words are very ambiguous. I don't mean right? to say I have stage fright. My dad's calling me. No you know, problem. You'll get no pissed problem. off. No problem. I might have to like end this scene. No problem. Okay. I don't no want to get him angry. No, no. Spe of course. Brother, Spe it was lovely speaking to you. Lovely speaking to you, Christos. Yeah? No, no, what's your guy's name? Sorry. Hamza. Hamza. Raihan. Raihan. Are you, when are you, you back John's next? Yeah. Uh, this is my tag team partner. We're making our debut. Oh my yeah. gosh, man! <laughs> you got some. You want to tag him? Yeah, 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 you want to tag Christos. We spoke to Christos. He's he's a, he's a really nice person. Very nice person to speak to. And inshallah, I hope inshallah that when he comes back next time, 
we can continue this conversation. Unfortunately, there was a few questions that I asked. Wasn't answered, but inshallah, next time, hopefully when we have this conversation again, we will have a more of a fruitful discussion. But unfortunately, he had to go. But may Allah guide him and may Allah bless him. Anything you need to say? I mean, yeah, I mean, this, this conversation was very fruitful because um, uh, he, he appealed to the church tradition. Oh, very, I noticed that. It's a very, very important. So, and he's um, well read up as well. Hmm? He's quite read he's up. He's very well, well read up. And uh, I think it's important as Muslims, uh, when you do come across Christians who, you know, appeal to the church tradition, um, we should also be f familiarized with that. Um, so I, I would recommend one book if you do want to look into the church tradition. Um, it's called The Early Christian Doctrine by James E. Kelly. It's a very, very good book. It goes into the history, how the Christian creed got developed. Um, so it covers the, uh, the Council of Nicaea to the Council of Chalcedon. Um, and it's a very, very interesting book. Um, so, uh, so we had a great discussion with him. He was very respectful. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, guide him to Islam. Amen. Amen. And hopefully we can have more discussion with him in the future. Amen. Uh, Jazakallah for this. Jazakallah <laughs> <laughs>